Hi, I'm Scott Stevens, lead pastor of Northway Christian Community. I'm excited you're here to listen to this message from our teaching team. I'm also excited that you are intentionally seeking to grow in your relationship with Jesus. By watching this message, our hope is your faith will be challenged as you learn more about who God is and how much he loves each and every one of us. However, watching or listening to a message is just one part of spiritual growth. In addition to being challenged by a message, I believe it's so important to be part of a local church community. At a local church, you can develop friendships and insights with other believers and also help to connect with those who are searching for God and not yet following Jesus. So, whether it is Northway or, or one of the other great churches throughout the Pittsburgh region, or if you're watching from some other part of the world, please consider taking this step toward being part of a local church. And if you do visit Northway, I want you to know that we are a church community that is passionate about learning to love people where we live and work and play. And there is certainly room for you at all of our Pittsburgh locations. Visit our website at northway.org for all the details. Hey folks, enjoy the message and we hope to see you soon. So I am very excited to kick off 2019 Book of the Bible teaching series. You know, you might not realize it's been our tradition for many years at Northway to choose a book of the Bible each year and to journey through it together as a church. If it's a really small book, we might knock it out in one series. If it's a long book, we might do it in several series over a season or even throughout the entire year. Um, you might not be aware of this, but here's some of the books that we've done in the past. If you're newer to Northway, that's what we've gone over in the last you know, 10 years or so. So before I like dig in um, to the book of the Bible this year, I want to celebrate you, Northway, across all of our locations. Last week at the close of my sermon, um, it was on being for the overlooked in, in our city. Um, I challenged us as a church to meet a need. The, the National Down Syndrome Convention is coming to the David L. Lawrence Convention Center at the end of June, and we got word that they needed volunteers. They needed volunteers to come and play with the kids, educational games, make crafts with these kids with Downs so that the parents can be in the conference, getting all kinds of information and resource. And I put the challenge out. This was the slide from last week. This is what it looked like, and I challenged us. I said, let's fill these slots. Well, I received an email from the volunteer coordinator, and she said this, that she was overwhelmed ecstatic from, from the number of volunteers that signed up. And she wanted to make sure that I thank Northway for being such a kind church. So well done, Northway. Seriously, well done. Thank you for all of you, for all of you that jumped into that. Um, if you didn't sign up and you still want to, there's information out at the Connect Centers at all of your locations. I think there's also information in your notes. I just want to say this, special shout out to our East End location. Um, their response to this need was overwhelming. Like, East End, you guys just crushed it. Well, well done, seriously. So, last year, over the summer, we studied the book of 1 Samuel together. And if you were with us, we lensed it as like a summer mini-series, right? We did it over nine weeks, or we called them episodes. We took a two-week break in the middle. And if you're with us, so 1 Samuel, in part one of that, we focused on the man that the book was named after. We focused on this prophet, Samuel, and we, we saw that, man, he like, he, he just urged um, the, the nation of Israel to trust God. He pleaded with them, don't choose a king to rule over you. Just simply allow God to be your king. But in the end, the people wanted a king, and God heard from them, and he gave them what they wanted. And Samuel anointed the first king of Israel, a man by the name of Saul. Well, the, the moral of that lesson is careful what you wish for, right? Because it went bad quickly that we learned. King Saul disobeys God. God lifts his hand of protection and anointing from Saul. And Saul spins out of control, basically becomes a, a madman. In the second part of that miniseries on, on 1 Samuel last summer, we watched Samuel go on God's request and he privately anointed a young shepherd boy by the name of David to be Israel's second king. And we covered epic stories like David and Goliath. We, we saw Saul's rage and, and jealousy come against young David as he hunts him down, as he tries to kill him 
on, on several occasions. We studied this unique relationship between David and Jonathan, King Saul's son, Jonathan. Jonathan, who was next in line for the throne. Him and David formed this incredible friendship, so much so that Jonathan, like, saves David's life from his own father. You know, the story or the final episode, last summer, um, David is ready to be king. And, and Saul, he seems doomed to destroy himself. If you want to go back, those sermons are all on our website. You can go back and get caught up on 1 Samuel. So this year, like probably about six or eight months ago, we decided rather than reinvent the wheel, we just decide to turn the page. And let's study the book of 2 Samuel together this summer. So today we launch off uh, an eight-week, eight-part, eight-episode series on 2 Samuel. Each episode, like, you know, it's going to be depicted like with this movie poster style. You saw it in that sort of opening video with that intense music, sort of the different episodes. The poster is going to join us on stage each week to sort of show where we're headed. So today, we're going to read that this once shepherd boy, David, that we saw in the book of 1 Samuel, becomes now King David in, in, in 2 Samuel. And just like last year, we're going to do it and take a break in the middle um, for two weeks and then come back and finish it up. And before I dig in, like, let, let me just take a couple minutes and get us historically caught up. So stay with me. What happens in this transition from 1 Samuel into the book of 2 Samuel? Well, 1 Samuel ends gruesomely. I don't know how else to put it. Saul and his son, Jonathan, die on the battlefield. And the Philistine soldiers, the arch enemy of Israel, take Saul's body. They strip him of his armor, they behead him, and they publicly display his body. And then they spread the word throughout the land of Israel's demise. Their king, Saul, is dead. So see, it's really important here. What did David do when he receives the news of King Saul's death? Now remember, Saul despised David. Saul tried to take David's life. Does David rejoice at the news that, that Saul is dead? Does, does he like sort of say, like, it's about time that madman's dead. Now, now I can begin to make a name for myself. Nope. It's recorded early on in the book of 2 Samuel that David mourns. And in fact, he gets the entire nation to mourn, to lament, to grieve with them. That their king, the one that God, you know, anointed, is dead. What happens next, like, is, is just messy. Chapters 2, 3, and 4 of, of 2 Samuel, we find revenge and we find murder. We, we find those that are loyal to King Saul, like some of his family members and his generals. You know, they're grasping for power against those that are now loyal um, to King David. Those chapters are not Israel at its finest. But eventually, as we'll see in a couple minutes, David is installed as king. He's 30 years old. Can you imagine the decisions that is facing him at this time? Like Jerusalem, their capital city, there is occupied by a foreign nation. Uh, the Philistines, among uh, many other nations, are lining up to come to battle with them because they see Israel as weak. They're not unified, and they're going to test this new young king. And we're going to pick up there in, in just a second. But before I jump there, I want you to know this, that like this eight-week series is going to have a couple threads through them because we don't want it just to feel like eight different stories. We've, we, we have a theme, two themes that you're going to hear us talk about a lot over the next week, eight weeks. And here, here's the first one. I'm just going to, I'm going to give you this theme as a question. Are you facing a decision in your life right now? So just think about that. Is there a decision right now, you know, that, that maybe you're at the crossroads so, somewhere in your life, in a relationship or, or with a career? Maybe you're faced with a decision right now, and frankly, like, none of the options seem very pleasant. Maybe, maybe you're faced with a decision right now, and you've got, like, a couple good options, and you're just struggling, like, which of these good options should I pick from? The first four weeks of this series, we will witness David make very good decisions, and our hope is to learn in order that we can make healthy and wise decisions. 
But unfortunately, in part two of this series, in episodes five, six, seven, and eight, we're going to watch David make poor, even horrendous decisions. And as we study this, our hope is that, to help all of us avoid those kind of dis disastrous decisions in our life. The second thread is sort of simple, but I think it's so important. David's greatness as king, right, it, it just illustrates how awesome it is to have a wonderful leader, a, a wonderful king. But David's ruin in the second half, it, it reminds us of the need for an even better king. You know, a, a, a truer king than David. David, he actually reminds us of a promised king that through his family line, through his lineage, will come the perfect king, Jesus. So let's pick up in 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 1. Then all the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and said, Behold, we are your bone and flesh. They're basically saying, we're with you. In times past, when Saul was king over us, it was you who led out and brought in Israel, meaning you were the one. You were out front leading the battles for Israel. And the Lord said to you, you shall be shepherd of my people Israel, and you shall be prince over Israel. So all the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron, and King David made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed him. There it is, king over Israel. David was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned for over 40 years. The people basically put their trust in David. And immediately, David marches his men to Jerusalem. And they basically defeat the occupying enemy there and reclaim the city. And skipping down to verse 10, it says this, And David became greater and greater, for the Lord, the God of hosts, was with him. And Hiram, king of Tyre, sent messengers to David, and cedar trees, also carpenters, and, and masons who built a house for David. So David also began to amass friendships and loyalties among other nations. And David knew that, I love this verse, and David knew that the Lord had established him king over Israel, and that he had exalted his kingdom for the sake of his people. David had a lot of really great early victories, and he received a lot of great praise for, from the people. But, but I love verse 12 so much. Like, like look at that for a minute. Why, why did it jump off the page to me as I was studying this? Because it says that David knew that God had established him king. David right there, he knew it wasn't about him. Like a really big point here, when it, when it comes to making wise decisions, David was not trying to make a name for himself. He knew who had established him, king. He wasn't out to make a name for himself because years ago, God had given him a name. What was the name that God gave David? He said, David, you are a man after my heart. And David embraced that name that God gave him. David took it. David decided to live out that name. He was going to be a man that was after God's heart. Here's a big statement for you. I believe some of the worst decisions that we will make in life is when we are trying to make a name for ourselves. When you make a decision based on just trying to make a name for yourself, you often crush the people around you. Let me just un unpack that for a minute. Stick with me. There, there's power in a name, right? But there also can be pain. And I'm not talking about the name on your driver's license. I'm talking about the names that people call you. I'm talking about like your reputation, how, how you're thought of. You know, that Jesus, do you, know, you realize he's called by over 150 plus names in the Bible, right? He, he was called the, the advocate, Jesus was referred to as a deliverer. Jesus was called by people the good shepherd, the, the mediator, the mighty one, the rock. He was called the way, the truth. Jesus was called by some people the prince of peace. That's just to name a few. I think all of us desire to, to be called by a good name, right? Proverbs 21, I love the first part of this verse. It says, a good name is to be chosen rather than great riches. Man, a good name. Is, is better than great riches, is, is favor, it's better than, than silver or gold. It's natural to want, though, to make a name for ourselves, right? I think somehow, like, we just get told that. 
We, we graduate college or we, we start a new job and somebody slaps us in the back and says, go make a name for yourself, kid, right? See, see I, I'll tell you though, if you're not careful, making a name for yourself can be exhausting because once you make a name for yourself, you have to keep that name because no one's going to keep it for you. If you decide that you want your name to be rich, successful, then it's up to you to keep it. Something even lighter, like you decide you're going to make your name to be, yeah, I'm going to be sharp dressed, right? Well, then you've got to maintain that style. If you want your name to be life of the party, then you're going to have to keep that even when the party has ended. See, we all try to make names for ourselves, don't we? I don't know what yours is. What, what kind of name are you trying to make for yourself? Perfect dad? I want to make a name for myself as perfect dad. I want to be known as the funny one. I want to make a name for myself as best student. I am going to, I'm going to get top of my class. I'm going to be best athlete. That's the name I'm going to make for myself. Maybe it's perfect wife. Perfect mom. Why, why do we do this? I think it's because there's often another set of names that's inside of us that we carry and that we often keep covered. Maybe someone at some point called you dumb or ugly and that's the name that you're, you're carrying. Maybe they didn't even say it out loud. Maybe you just somehow picked it up when your parents divorced or your marriage crashed or that boyfriend or girlfriend told you that they have changed your mind, their mind and, and you picked up a name like unlovable, not enough, the disappointment, worthless. See, do you really want to keep making a name for yourself? Do you really want to go on believing those names that you hear inside your head? Or do you want to accept a better name? See, see, you can make a name for yourself or you can take the name that God has already given you. God has a name for you. God has already called you a name. And it's not what's on your driver's license. And God is not in the business of forgetting names. I don't see anywhere in the Bible where Jesus sort of says, um, you with the temper. What was your name again? Jeffrey, Jonathan, what was your name? Right? I, I don't ever see that. My dad used to do that all the time. Like, he was terrible at remembering names. So, so he just called everyone Tiger. That was just it. Like, you were Tiger. Everyone was Tiger. All my brothers, we were Tiger. I just you just you always forget everybody's name. I'd be, I'd be, I have a friend over, and my dad would say, oh, like, Hi there, Tiger. I'm like, Dad, his name is Mike. He's lived next door for five years. You got, you got to learn his name, all right? See, that's not God. He's not going to forget your name. He knows your name. Uh, Isaiah 45, it says this, I will give you the treasures of darkness and the hordes and secret places that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by your name. To God, you are not Tiger. God, God knows your name. And it's not, again, the one on your driver's license. When God, he, he knows. And when you understand that God exists, and when you really allow his grace to, to be poured over you through his son, Jesus Christ, you get the right to be named a child of God. That's your name, right? John chapter 1 says, But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Take that name. Take the name God has for you and stop trying to make a name for yourself. Let me just push this a little farther through Galatians. It says, for through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, and I love this, but Christ who lives in me. See, see, and the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Folks, with Jesus living inside you, you gotta, you got to hear this. When God looks at you, he doesn't see the names worthless or dumb or ugly. He does, when God looks at you, he does not see your sin. He sees his son, Jesus, living inside you. And therefore, he sees you by the same names 
that his son Jesus was called. He sees you as good. He sees you as an advocate. He sees you as the mighty one. He sees you as rock. So you see, the Father in heaven, he calls you son or daughter. That's your name. And if you want to start making good decisions in life, stop exhausting yourself making a name for yourself and just take the one, receive the one that he's already called you, beloved son or daughter of the Most High God. David knew his name. David knew he was a man after God's heart. David knew God, established him as king. David knew his decisions needed to be for the people God entrusted to him, not to make a name for himself. Take the name God has given you. Know that he is the one that established you as boss or business leader or student or teacher or mom or dad or whatever. The position that he's established you in, he's established you there so that you can make the d- decisions based on those that he's entrusted you with, not based on you just wanting to make a name for yourself. When we do this, we will stop exhausting ourselves and we will make better decisions for ourselves and for the people that we care for. So now David, he knows who he is. He's making great decisions. And just watch him lead. In, in, in chapter 5, verse 18, it says with David, it says, now the Philistines had come and spread out in the, in the valley of Rephaim. And David, I love this, and David inquired of the Lord, shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you give them into my hand? And the Lord said to David, go up, for I will certainly give the Philistines into your hand. And David came to baal Perazim, and David defeated them there. And he said, the Lord has broken through my enemies before me like a breaking flood. Therefore, the name of that place is called baal Perazim. He gave it a new name, the breakthrough. And the Philistines left their idols there, and David and his men carried them away. And, but the Philistines weren't done. They're going to test this young king. It says, and the Philistines came up yet again and spread out in the valley of Rephraim. And, and when David inquired, did you pick up on that? There he is. He's inquiring of God again, of the Lord. And God said to him, hey, wait, you shall not go up. Go around to their rear and, and come up against them opposite the balsam trees. And when you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the balsam trees, then rouse yourself. So then get up. And the Lord has gone out before you and strike down the army of the Philistines. And David did as the Lord commanded him. David inquired of the Lord. David heard from the Lord. David did what the Lord commanded him. And he has victory in that moment. Did you notice like that in that just quick few verses that David inquires of the Lord twice before moving forward? Let me just say this. Deciding on your own and moving forward without first inquiring from the Lord can be disastrous. You know, I I need everyone like just right now, so be really super honest with yourself, okay? I'm not going to have you raise your hand. You don't have to tell anybody your answer to this. But I just want you to be super honest with yourself in this moment, okay? Okay? Here's my question. Do you inquire of the Lord before deciding and moving forward? Let me just ask it a different way. How often do you pause and ask God what to do with the decision that you're facing? Do you do it like maybe only on the really big decisions? I I do that, like on the really big things. Sure, I, I, I do that, Scott. Or do you do it only when you're afraid? Or do you do it only when God, God, you really need to come through on this one. Don't you see what's going on here? I need to make a decision. Something needs to happen. So then you inquire of the Lord. Or or do you only inquire like after you've already made your decision and it's not going so well, now you're going to come back and inquire of the Lord. Okay, this isn't going well. God, I forgot to ask you, what should I do? See, or do, do you inquire consistently? Always. Big or small. See, when it comes to inquiring, to to praying about a decision in your life, big or small, please hear me on this. Like it's not about the request. It's about the relationship. Because God already knows your request. He already knows before you ask. Prayer, inquiring of the Lord, it's not about the request. Prayer is mainly about building relational trust with God. 
Did you just pick up on that when I read that text about why did it seem so natural for David to inquire of the Lord? Did you notice he didn't even give God like a lot of details? He didn't say, okay, God, you see what's going on here? Like they're spread out all over this valley and they're coming at me from all sides. Like he didn't give him any details. He said, what should I do here? Did you notice that like David didn't have to reintroduce, reintroduce himself to God? He'd be like, hey, God, like remember me, David. Things have been going really well. Like you do greater and greater things, you know, victories. No, no, he didn't, he didn't have to reintroduce himself. Right? Why? Why does this seem so natural to David? Because he and God had years of relational trust together. He and God had just years of him inquiring to God way back from his childhood, tending sheep, being chosen as king, running from Saul, victories and setbacks. David had consistently inquired of the Lord and God had shown himself to be trustworthy to David. See, inquiring of the Lord in those decision moments of your life is crucial. But please hear me, it's not about the request. It's about the relationship that God desires to have with you. You know, my oldest daughter, Alyssa, um, married Matt almost four years ago. I love Matt, like, man, great son-in-law, great, great, great dude. Um, but one of the greatest things for me about Alyssa marrying Matt was that Matt had a nine-year-old son named Carter. And uh, I gained a son-in-law and a grandson on the same day. Alyssa met Matt actually on account of Carter. Alyssa was Carter's kids' ministry leader in kids' church here, here at the Wexford location. Carter was Alyssa's favorite kid in kids' ministry for years before Matt ever became her favorite guy, right? But see, Carter, he didn't know me. Like, I'd known him for a little bit when they were dating. And it was even a struggle for, like, he didn't even know what to call me. He would call me, like, Alyssa's dad. Or Pastor Scott, because he knew me as a pastor. And initially, every chance I got, I intentionally tried to get to know him. He wrestled, so I went to his wrestling matches every chance I could go. I purposely, every time we were around together, I would just, I'd, I'd make a beeline for him in the room and just talk to him. Ask him if he wanted to like go for a walk, find out what interested him. And over the last few years, from time to time now, I get to take him out, like one-on-one, -on -one, just, just he and I. Um, he loves going to Dave and Buster's. On a side night, you can drop $100 at Dave and Buster's with a 10-year-old faster than you can at the casino. Like, goodness sakes, my card's empty, my card's empty. Well, how can your card be empty? Well, when we go to Dave and Buster's, you know, Carter's goal is to have a blast. My goal is to increase trust. See, see Last year, I went on a two-day canoeing and camping trip. And you know I do not camp. I do not like to camp. I went. I thought it would be fun maybe, but I went because Carter was going. He's come on family vacations with us to Florida. We spent a lot of time fishing, talking. You know, he didn't know me for the first eight or ten years or so of his life. We had a lot of catching up to do. Building trust takes time. It takes a lot of conversations. Recently, he and I turned a corner like he's beginning to tell me things. You know, he, he inquires. And he has great parents and a lot of family structure and grandparents around him. I just have always wanted to make sure that he knows that I'm there for him. If he needs anybody to talk to to figure things out. Folks, that's what God desires from you. Inquiring of the Lord, praying, it's building intentional trust. It's been four plus years now of building intentional trust with Carter. And he still makes a lot of requests. He still asks for a lot of things, right? We're out somewhere, you know, can you buy that for me? You know, can we go to Dave and Buster's? I'm like, we were there yesterday. No, we're not, I'm not dropping another hundred there. No, we're out one day and he goes, I need wrestling shoes, okay? But for me, it's not about his requests. It's about the relationship. D do you have some catching up to do with your relationship with God? Go ahead and make the request of God. He already knows what you want. God cares about your request. 
But it's not about the request, it's about the relationship. Eight months ago, Alyssa and Matt had a son. Little Wyatt came along. And you know, I'm blessed, he just, he lives so close. They're, they're at our Beaver Valley location. Child out Beaver Valley. So I get to see him a lot. I get to see him every week. He knows me. Like he knows my voice. You know, when I reach out my hands, he comes to me. He, 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 he trusts me. I'm knowing him right fr- from the beginning. Maybe that's your relationship with God. Maybe you've known God for so long. And this trust comes really easy. You had the blessing of growing up around church or maybe in a Christian family. And you just, you get this trust thing and it's, it's going, don't ever take that for granted. Maybe this is newer to you. And you got some catching up to do when it comes to trusting the Lord. Hey, throw your request at him. He wants to hear what's on your heart. He wants to know what you need. He's going to go like, I, I, I know. What he really wants is the relationship. He wants to help you make really good, wise decisions. Our true king, Jesus, our great king, Jesus, cares about your request, but he desires a relationship. Don't make decisions based on needing to make a name for yourself. Take the name that he has already given you. In all the decisions of your life, take your request to him. Right? Take the request to him, but please know this. He is way more interested in a relationship with you. Let me pray. God, we're all faced with big decisions. I'm sure right now with the sound of this voice, whether people are listening to this at one of our locations or online, they're faced with a decision. God, help us bring our request to you, but help us, more importantly, desire a relationship with you. God, reveal yourself. Show yourself to be trusted. Help us with the great decisions in life. We lift these things up in your son's name. Amen.